actually, being a campaign trail reporter, I've been to almost every city in America more than once, but actually I've never had the opportunity to be in Chattanooga, so this was uh, something that I was very happy to accept this invitation. So thank you for having me here, first of all. Um, everyone watched the uh, South Carolina primaries a couple weeks ago? Thanks, Pat. So I was in South Carolina uh, a few weeks ago uh, after not having been on the campaign trail for a while. And I uh, ran into an old colleague uh, and I, uh, who I had seen from the 08 and 04 elections. And I said to him, I said, man, you're still doing this stuff. He says, um, yeah, but don't tell my mother. She still thinks I'm a piano player at a whorehouse. <laughs> An old joke, but uh, I give him credit, he was right on the money, and I thought that was uh, a good way to start this discussion um, about campaign trail, about the campaign trail and presidential politics. Obviously, we're in a campaign season. Uh, this is a historic and extremely interesting presidential election, and the thing that I think makes it most interesting is that it's taking place at a time when there are two uh, parallel protest movements. Uh, propping up on both sides of the aisle, sort of one, the Occupy Wall Street movement that, roughly speaking, is on the left, and then the Tea Party movement, which started a couple of years ago, uh, that is more or less on the right, although there's some crossover between all these movements. And I think what's, there's a unifying factor in both of these, um, both of these movements is that is there's dissatisfaction with the electoral process, uh, there's a, um, an overwhelming feeling, I think, in both movements that there is something fake about our electoral system and, our, and the campaign system, uh, that it's stage managed, uh, and that it's uh, too easily manipulated by special interests. I think both, both movements uh, strongly feel that the process no longer uh, produces candidates who respond to their particular needs. And um, I, I agree with a lot of that, and I think. Uh, I came to a lot of those same conclusions years ago, and what I really want to do here tonight is just sort of talk about how I how I came to have that point of view about the presidential election and the campaign trail and campaign journalism. Uh, and I think the best way for me to do that is to sort of tell the story of, of um, how I ended up uh, on the, the campaign trail and, and sort of what I saw once I got there. Um, I had an extremely odd, I had a very odd life. With, but I've had an extremely odd road to becoming a, a campaign journalist. I'm sure it's exactly what they wouldn't teach uh, at the Columbia Jour Journalism School about how to end up uh, on a campaign plane. Uh, first of all, I grew up around journalists my whole life. My father uh, was a television, was and is a television journalist. My uh, stepmother uh, was a TV anchor woman. Uh, my godparents were journalists. Basically, every growing up that I knew uh, growing up was in the, the media business. And in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up, uh, my whole image of what a, what a political journalist was, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, is that he was a jerk. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, you know, a journalist, I mean, we have a lot of talk these days about uh, the liberal media, but when I was growing up, um, Journalists, it was less important. They, they really didn't have politics, the people that I knew, uh, or it was a secondary concern. They really just kind of hated everybody. And, uh, they were wise asses and wanted to give people a hard time, particularly people in power uh, or people who were very rich. Uh, just to give you an example of the kind of uh, people that I, I grew up around, when I was 17 years old, I um, took an internship with the Village Voice and I worked with uh, a very uh, a very famous in New York investigative reporter named Wayne Barrett. Does anyone know that name? Um, he's, well, he's famous in New York anyway, and I worked with him and uh, uh, a guy named Bill Bastone. Uh, and I was this sort of young kid who didn't really know anything at all. And they were both completely irascible guys who just hated everybody. And one of the things I noticed is that we were constantly putting pictures and news clippings up on the wall, and any picture of anybody was like instantly defaced. Like there was there were horns and you know mustaches drawn on anybody's picture, and uh, I very particularly remember that um, 
one day I came in and somebody put up a picture of Mary Lou Redden. Uh, <laughs> like, like the most innocuous person you could possibly imagine. And I, it was up one day, I came in the next morning and it was like completely blackened out. It had like a, you know, a Satan beard on it. And, uh, and I said to uh, Bill Bastone, the reporter who had clearly done this, so I'm like, Bill, what do you have against Mary Lou Redden? He just went, <laughs> that's sort of, that's, to me was what a journalist was. He just had that attitude about everything. Um, and I totally respected that. Uh, that. That was a great thing. And those guys were really funny, but I, I never wanted to be that. Um, my ambition when I was growing up was to be a fiction writer. I, uh, my heroes, when I was a kid, were all comic novelist, and I thought that I was going to be somebody who wrote a book like you know, Catch-22 or Decline and Fall or uh, something like that. And so that was my, you know, when I was the same age as a lot of the people in this audience, or at least a few of them, the students, um, that was my plan uh, for, for my life, was to get out of college, uh, start writing novels, and immediately have a, a career and a living. Um, and because my favorite writers were all uh, Russians, uh, I moved to Russia right out of uh, right out of college. And my uh, ambition was to learn the language so that I could read all my favorite writers, like Google in Russian. And I was going to write novels in Russia and become famous, and everything was going to work out well. Um, it's sort of like that, you know, that uh, Woody Allen joke about how yeah, the food here is terrible, and yeah, the portions are small too. Um, that was kind of like me with fiction writing. Like not only did I did my fiction suck, but I couldn't finish any of it. Um, so I was sort of relegated to going into the family business, which was the one thing I really knew how to do in life. Uh, and so I'm 21, 22 years old, and I'm in St. Petersburg, Russia, and I'm jobless. Uh, so I started going around to all the news bureaus in Moscow and offering myself up as a, as a news reporter. And I started trying to sell uh, news stories. And just to give you an example of the kind of hard-hitting journalism that I did uh, during those days, which is right after the fall of communism, one of the first things I ever wrote was um, a story about how uh, the gorillas at the St. Petersburg Zoo uh, were getting bananas for the first time. Uh, as communism had ended and they were finally able to buy uh, bananas on the free market. 